a few months after Russia joining the WTO and the first few, um, let's say, incidents or new realities coming to light, we thought it might be good uh, to already, before the end of this year, um, take stock and discuss about opportunities and challenges of that new step in trade relations. I'm extremely happy to see that so many of you followed our invitation to come here and uh, I look forward to a lively discussion for you. Uh, just from a small organizational point of view, there is translation into Russian, so those of you who prefer to listen to the discussions here in Russian, you can do that via your headphones. I see some of you already do that in any case. So I'm extremely delighted to have such a um, fantastic panel of speakers here and a second fantastic panel in the waiting, so to say. Um, I guess most of the speakers won't need to be introduced at all because you all know them, uh, follow them on Twitter or their other um, media activities and are updated about the latest developments in their work. But nevertheless, let me just introduce to you on my right um, the person who is in charge of, um, of a smooth running of the seminar, and that is Joshua Chaffin, who is from the Financial Times, a correspondent originally from the US, so another, so to say, international element in that. So I guess this gives a totally unbiased view on EU-Russia relations, so we're very happy that you're here and uh, will uh, guide us through that seminar. But now to the speakers. Maybe I start from the very right and then move on to the uh, very left. There is Viktor Kalmikov, who is the who speaks fluent German. I would not be, uh, wouldn't have been able to distinguish them as a non-German native speaker when we just had a short chat before the beginning of the seminar, who is the deputy head of the permanent representation of the Russian Federation and who will obviously talk to us about the Russian perspective on WTO accession, Christina Oyuland, um, co-host, also member of the European Parliament, Alde Group, and uh, the ALDE spokesperson on Russia in the Foreign Affairs Committee, Pascal Lamy, who you all know, the Secretary General of the WTO, and who is, um, well, I mean, overlooking all this and uh, giving us the, um, the perspective of the WTO on that discussion. Myself, Silvana Kuchmerin, also from ALDE, Karel de Gücht, the EU Commissioner for Trade, and um, in, in charge of the European side of, of trade policies. And um, I guess his left hand and right half of brain, if I may say so, um, uh, who's up here as well. And we look very much forward to the discussion. Just to give a two, three headlines about what does Russian accession to WTO mean. Well, it's for Russia, I guess, uh, one of the most important steps in economic history. And um, to be part of uh, the WTO, which is a trade club with very strict and also fair rules, certainly makes it um, an important step internally as well as externally on, on trade issues. Accession to the WTO, and we saw that in other cases, like the case of China, means that there are promises for change, and uh, this brings upon the sense of opportunities, of new business, but obviously, and this we were able to see at a very recent visit of the Trade Committee of the Parliament to Moscow, also in some ways um, some feelings of apprehension that Russia has an incredibly economic, incredibly big economic potential, I think goes without saying, um, 140 million consumers, um, educated workforce, lots of land, a lot of resources, but all this also makes it then a challenge because we can see that the Russian economy today is even less diversity, uh, diversified than it was 10 years ago. So to rely on one's own resources, mainly energy, obviously also brings a risk because other reforms which might be necessary then are put back and are not fulfilled. Because if you look at it, the dependence on the energy product in the last 10 years has risen from 44 to 69 percent and the government's revenues they almost 70% um, almost are of the export earnings, which are then again gained through energy exports, which is uh, 
a very, well, very obvious proof of a very little diversification. So I guess WTO accession could mean that there are some opportunities at stake, but just how much change can we expect? Well, what we saw now is that we still have to hope, in a way, that Russian leaders see the WTO accession as a big momentum for, for change, because the question is, will they rely more on the Eurasian Customs Union, which is an ambitious, I guess, also in some way political project, or will they engage more with the WTO community? A lot of indicators show that there is a lot of need for reform, and uh, what we see now is that we have, just after the accession, some of the legislation introduced by the Russian government don't give the signal of being more open and relying on more um, fair and strict rules, but in a way testing the limits of WTO membership. Having said all that, I will now stop talking and um, give the floor, hand the floor over to our uh, moderator. And uh, let me just say that I hope that disputes that will arise can now, as both the EU as well as Russia are in WTO, can be solved in a less political, but more in a rules-based manner. And I think this would be to, uh, the advantage of good trade relations for both sides. Thank you. Thank you very much, Silvana. And thanks, a special thanks to the ALDI group for uh, putting this event together and for inviting me. Um, as it happens, we were actually discussing this, this very topic in our office uh, just a few days before the invitation arrived. So it's very much, uh, very much on our minds, uh, and I think a very interesting subject. And I think, as Silvana mentioned, a very, an excellent, excellent panel to discuss it. Um, I, Commissioner de Gucht himself, uh, a few months ago in a speech, described the EU-Russia relationship uh, as a complex one. And I don't think anybody would dispute that. The two are clearly mutually dependent uh, when it comes to energy, uh, commerce, a whole bunch of other areas. But at the same time, uh, I would say there, there is often a, a lack of harmony. Um, that lack of harmony, for journalists at least, has been uh, quite interesting and kept us very busy, whether it's uh, uh, in the field of energy or whether it's uh, antitrust investigations into Gazprom uh, or in the, in the realm of foreign affairs. Um, now, it was hoped uh, very clearly that Russia's accession to the WTO would um, improve that relationship, at least in one area, in, in trade and commerce. And I think that it's clear that there's a feeling in this town, at least uh, in the early days, um, that things have not improved, uh, or at least have not begun to travel uh, in the direction that was hoped. Um, so I, I suppose the, the, the big question that we're all trying to answer is how will the relationship now evolve going forward? Uh, and as I said, we have an excellent panel here to discuss it. Um, each of the speakers is going to make some remarks afterwards. I have a few questions, but I would also like uh, members of the audience, I would invite you to, to uh, prepare your own questions and get involved. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass uh, pass the floor first to Commissioner de Gucht. Thank you. Um, and uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, in fact, this year has been an important year for EU-Russia uh, trade relations. For 19 years, since 1993, the same issue remained at the top of our agenda, Russia's accession to the World Trade Organization. But this year, we finally reached that milestone thanks to the hard work of many in Russia, the European Union, other WTO, WTO members, and, of course, Pascal Lamy and his team. Joining the WTO is not just the end of a negotiation. It, is, uh, it should be the beginning of a process of reform. Signing an agreement on paper is very different from putting it into practice. Russia made many specific commitments to its fellow WTO members as part of that agreement. It now has to abide by the whole body of WTO law, like all, others, like all other WTO members. Accession is uh, just the beginning also because trade liberalization alone will not fix all the troubles that ail any economy. Russia's economy has uh, many strong points, but it uh, also faces 
many challenges, especially the need to shift the economy's center of gravity away from resource uh, extraction and uh, into higher technology manufacturing and services. This is essential to broaden the base of prosperity and is already high on the agenda of Russian leaders. Implementing Russia's WTO commitments will help with this effort by improving the quality of regulation, by increasing competition and therefore productivity in imported industries, and by providing new market access abroad for Russian companies in sectors like steel, chemicals, and food and drink. But these changes will not be enough on their own. The modernization project requires Russia to go further addressing weaknesses in the rule of law, strengthening the financial system, promoting innovation, building infrastructure, and attracting more foreign investment. In short, I believe that Russia needs to embrace the spirit of open competitive markets as well as the letter of the WTO law. Only that way can dependence on the roulette wheel of global commodity prices be reduced. Only that way can Russia position itself to the highly competitive century ahead. And that's why I said in September that Russia faces a choice between a high road of effective reform and the prospect of continued economic success, and the low road where not much changes and the future is more uncertain. At the conference in Helsinki where I made those remarks, Russia's chief negotiator confirmed his country's intention to take the high road. Three months uh, have now passed, and I must say that the picture is, if anything, less promising than it was then. I do accept that there are some positive signs about the intentions of the Russian government. Most encouraging is the very ambitious blueprint for modernization that uh, President Putin outlined earlier in the year, with uh, 25 million new jobs in high-tech industries by 2020, increasing labor productivity by 50 percent in six years, and taking Russia to the 20th position on the world banks doing business ranking over the same period. This type of plan is just what Russia needs, and Europe is ready to do its part to help Russia go down that road. That is why we want to include, why we want to conclude an ambitious new agreement to govern our relations that would help Russia develop world-class rules and improve its business environment. It's also why we are supporters of Russia's bid to join the OECD. At the same time, we have also seen several examples of recent action by the government that present a less encouraging outlook. In these areas, far from using its uh, new membership of the WTO as a tool for broader reform, Russia is not even meeting its commitments. Four issues are of particular concern. First, the decree on fees for recycling cars. Europe understands that there is an environmental need to encourage car recycling. We have effective legislation in this area ourselves, though it does not involve fees on this scale or as the main way to achieve its goal. Nonetheless, we have uh, very grave uh, concerns about the fact that the Russian legislation levies fees on imported vehicles alone. This discriminates against European producers and clashes with the most basic WTO rules. It also means cars imported from Europe are paying higher duties to the Russian government than before WTO accession. This situation is clearly unacceptable. Second, the import ban on live animals from Europe is a clear-cut breach in our mind. The regulatory measure has the effect of protecting Russian producers, not consumers. The ban on live animals is highly disproportionate to the risk it claims to address. And uh, while uh, Russia often criticizes others for overly stringent food safety legislation, this ban is the only one of its kind in existence anywhere in the world. The ban on slaughter pigs is even more so, resting on small irregularities and seemingly lacking any valid scientific basis. This type of issue is particularly important for the European Union, as uh, almost 10% of our total agricultural exports 
go to Russia. Third, Russia has decided on its own to raise the level of tariffs it applies to hundreds of imported products. This would again appear to breach one of the core elements of the WTO to make a legally binding commitment to keep duties or, or uh, at or below agreed levels. Fourth, the agreement we reached with uh, Russia on uh, wood exports was uh, central to the accession deal. Creating market conditions for international raw materials trade is also a core objective of EU commercial policy. However, while the agreed system is operating, the procedure to export wood at lower duties is very burdensome, much more burdensome than procedures for selling wood on the domestic markets. This creates incentives for producers to discriminate against sales to exporters. And these incentives need to be removed. These are just some of the areas where we have questions about Russia's implementation of its WTO commitments. We are looking closely into all the issues to see if Europe's rights or interests are affected. Now, the European Union understands that all countries have policy objectives they wish to pursue. Europe also wants to protect the environment and ensure high standards of food safety, for example. But the law of the WTO is clear that government action should be proportional. It should seek to solve problems, not to create new ones. Government policies should therefore be streamlined. They should not impede the flow of trade and investment any more than is strictly necessary. Getting that right is important for Russia's future economic prospects. It's also very important for the European Union because Russia, as you are all aware, as you are all aware is a crucial trading partner and a crucial destination for our foreign investment. Trade in goods between us comes to over 300 billion euros and trade in services to almost 40 billion euros. Europe holds 120 billion in investment stocks in uh, Russia, accounting for nearly three quarters of foreign investment in the economy, and Russia has more than 40 billion here. This means Europe needs Russia to succeed in the long term. For example, a more predictable regulatory environment will help the many European companies who trade with and have invested in China. But it also means we are severely affected in the short term if Russia chooses a part of restriction. That's why we want to see these problems resolved as soon as possible. We would prefer to negotiate our way to a solution that is the quickest and most effective way to resolve things. However. If that does not prove possible, we are most certainly prepared to use all the legal avenues at our disposal, and since Russia's accession, that includes dispute settlement at the WTO. We have been delivering this message to our counterparts in the Russian side for several months now. We are negotiating with them on all of these issues. Some of those negotiations have had limited progress, but every day we do not have a solution is the day our companies lose money, putting jobs at risk for European people at a time when we absolutely cannot afford to lose them. So the European Union will not wait forever to reach agreements. And the clock is ticking. Ladies and gentlemen, as two adjacent global scale markets, Russia and the European Union are pulled together by economic gravity. Even when we have differences, we will always be close partners. And that's why Europe's interest, as well as our desire, is for the closest economic ties possible with a dynamic and successful Russia. That is also why I am looking forward to the next EU-Russia summit on the 21st of December, which will give us a chance to move ahead on a whole range of issues and at the same time address the challenges which, will which still separate us. As I said at the outset, this has been a good year for relations between Moscow and Brussels. With a little work and with the right spirit on both sides, 2013 can be an even better one. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Strong words from the Commissioner. Uh, now, Mr. Lamy, please. Uh, thanks, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, following uh, Silvana's uh, introduction, let me try and briefly outline 
uh, how I see uh, the main uh, meanings of uh, this uh, WTO accession uh, without uh, entering into the details of the terms of accession, uh, nor departing from my uh, institutional uh, neutrality. Uh, I see four main uh, meanings to this accession, uh, starting uh, with uh, simply uh, politics. Russia's accession to WTO is uh, a powerful political signal. Uh, Russia was uh, uh, for a long time a member of the UN Security Council, a member of the G8, a member of the G20. Uh, not being a member of WTO uh, was in many ways a, a long uh, overdue oddity. But we all know, uh, and that's my second point, that uh, the main meaning of this accession uh, has to do with economics. Uh, it uh, is uh, an important uh, economic potential, both for Russian business as well as for uh, business outside uh, Russia. Uh, what it basically means is A, uh, more market opening, uh, and B, uh, anchoring Russia uh, in a set of uh, globally uh, agreed uh, rules and disciplines. And the market access side and the global rules side, uh, in my view, as, uh, are as important uh, one as another. Third uh, important meaning of this accession, uh, which is that uh, Russia uh, has shown a readiness uh, to uh, accept a high level of accountability, uh, which is uh, what a large part of uh, WTO uh, activity is about. Uh, starting with the accession negotiation, uh, which uh, meant that Russia had to uh, clarify, uh, sometimes uh, publish, sometimes establish, a number of uh, basic uh, rules of engagement uh, for business and trade. The start of a process where uh, Russia uh, was progressively uh, accustomed to more uh, international uh, scrutiny, uh, more accountability, uh, and uh, this is now the case uh, with the various procedures uh, which uh, WTO members have to uh, regularly uh, follow uh, in uh, various uh, WTO bodies, uh, trade policy reviews, uh, notification, uh, sometimes cross-notification uh, in uh, major committees uh, like the Technical Barriers to Trade Committee, like the Sanitary and Phytosanitary Committee, uh, the obligation to uh, publish uh, new laws, uh, new regulations to establish uh, inquiry points. Uh, all this is part of uh, the daily life of a WTO member, uh, and in many ways, uh, this is a new life uh, for uh, Russia. Now, not that uh, all this is about intrusion, uh, it's about uh, accountability uh, over the international commitments uh, which Russia has now adopted by its own will. <coughs> Last point, and uh, Silvana already uh, mentioned that uh, rapidly, uh, which is, of course, uh, the enormous potential uh, for modernization, uh, for diversification of the Russian economy uh, that uh, this uh, accession uh, entails. We all know that one of the weaknesses of the Russian economy uh, is uh, that it's very concentrated. Uh, notably on the trade side, on a uh, limited uh, set of products and also on a limited set of uh, external markets. Uh, uh, EU, uh, as one, is 50% of uh, Russia's uh, clients. Now, how can WTO accession uh, 
help this diversification. Uh, let me give you three uh, examples. First, uh, foreign direct investment. Uh, the experience of WTO accession uh, for the last uh, 15 years has shown that each time a country has joined WTO, uh, the flow of foreign direct investment has uh, rapidly increased after accession, uh, whether you take uh, uh, cases like uh, China, like uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, like Vietnam. And uh, my expectation is that <coughs> Russia uh, will uh, follow suit. Second area uh, where joining WTO uh, under terms such as the ones uh, Russia accepted uh, can help is, of course, services, uh, which is a major uh, catalyst of economic transformation, uh, including uh, in uh, fostering uh, the insertion of Russia in some of the global value chains, which are now uh, the uh, main pattern of international trade. Uh, third example uh, where uh, obligations that have been subscribed by, w by uh, Russia can help uh, transforming its own economy is, of course, uh, protection of intellectual property, which we know is an essential uh, factor for innovation. And we know that innovation is an essential factor of modern economy transformation. So that's, in my view, the sort of main feature, the main uh, meaning. Uh, final remark, uh, obviously, uh, a lot of that at this stage uh, is still uh, potential. Uh, whether uh, this potential uh, will uh, translate into reality uh, depends on uh, implementation. Uh, and on this, of course, uh, the jury uh, is still uh, out. Uh, the good news uh, is that we now know who the jury is, and the jury is the World Trade Organization. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Lemmy. Now over to Mr. Kolmakov. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, actually, I have to thank the European Parliament for organizing this event. And secondly, I have to thank Mr. Commissioner De Hucht for good, warm, and critical words towards my country. Uh, uh, after it, yeah, I, I would like to start with uh, my short presentation. You can see it on screen. Mr. Stefan Johansson. Uh, Secretary General and uh, Maxim Medvedkov, who uh, is a chief negotiator of, uh, of my country in the uh, exceeding uh, negotiations to the WTO. Uh, second, please. So, as you can see, records established, uh, not at all intended, but nevertheless, uh, we applied for accession to one organization, which was General Agreement on Tariff and Trade, but acceded to another one, to uh, WTO, and it took Russia exactly 18 years, six months, and three days to complete the negotiations. Actually, absolute record up till now. And, of course, tons of papers and uh, sleepless nights, and so on and so forth. But uh, within these 11 years, starting with 2000, uh, there were more than 1,500 rounds of negotiations held. Uh, 56 partners in, negotiation, in negotiations on trade and goods, and 28 partners in negotiations on trade and services. Here, the next one, please. Uh, uh, two very important documents. Uh, you can see uh, our uh, uh, apply for accession uh, to the WTO. And here, uh, second, please, uh, uh, next, please. Uh, final decision, uh, and uh, actually. I would like to stress the uh, 
last uh, sentence of this decision, the Russian Federation may accede to the WTO agreement on the terms and conditions set out in the protocol annexed to this decision. Next, please. But nevertheless, uh, public opinion in Russia is still divided over the merits and opportunities of the organization. As you can see, uh, the answer uh, to the question, do you think that Russia's accession to the WTO corresponds to Russia's interests or goes against them, nearly 40% uh, yeah, uh, answered yes, it corresponds. Uh, nearly 35% it goes against. And don't know, 27%. But Russia's leaders have clearly set out their strategic choices. Uh, WTO is neither absolute ill or absolute welfare. WTO is an instrument. Those who can use it get stronger. Those who cannot or do not want to learn and instead prefer to sit behind the fence of protectionist quotas and duties are doomed, strategically doomed. And um, who do you think said these words? Next, please. It was uh, Mr. Vladimir Putin, and he was president, and uh, he, it, it is an uh, excerpt from his speech to the Federal Assembly of the Russian Federation in April 2002. Next, please. And here are some key obligations of my country to the, uh, by the accession to the WTO. After full implementation of tariff reductions, the average final binding tariff ceiling for Russia will be 7.8% compared with 10% for all products, for all kind of products, I mean, in 2011. The ceiling average for manufactured imports is 7.3% compared with 9.5% average before the accession. The average tariff ceiling for agriculture products is 10.8% and before accession 13.2. Specific commitments on 11 services sectors and 116 subsectors. Export duties have been fixed for over 700 tariff lines, <clears throat> including certain products in the sectors of fish, mineral fuels and oils raw hides and skins, wood, pulp, and paper and base metals. Next, please. Uh, four sectoral agreements with the European Union, including uh, trade-related quotas on export of, ex exports of wood and trade in components of motor vehicles. The Russian Federation intends to join the WTO government procurement agreement and would initiate negotiations for membership within the next four years. The total trade distorting agriculture support will not exceed $9 billion in, for this year and would be gradually reduced to $4.4 billion by 2000, 2018. Or agricultural support subsidies are bound at zero. Russian producers and distributors of natural gas would operate in the base, on the basis of uh, normal commercial considerations based on recovery of costs and profits. And now some figures about our mutual trade. Uh, as you can see, we are the third uh, trading partner for the European Union and the European Union is first trading partner for Russia. Trade in goods, uh, well, uh, for, it, for the, in the previous year, uh, at the amount of 306.6 billion euros, and trade in services, as uh, Commissioner De Hoek already mentioned, about 40 uh, billion uh, euros in 2010. 
good dynamics of growth of mutual trade, but uh, of course, highly unbalanced trade pattern, which uh, with which we are not happy. Uh, oil, gas, and raw materials in exchange for equipment, machinery, and other investment goods. But uh, finally, uh, I have to stress that uh, the uh, progress in our mutual trade was quite significant. Uh, European Union import growth from Russia, 5.5% uh, 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 to June. Uh, June uh, 2012 to June 2011, and the EU export growth to Russia, 18.1 percent. Now some uh, irritants in bilateral trade relations. Uh, Russia's concern, trade in nuclear, ma nuclear materials, energy cost adjustments, in uh, anti-damping investigations, a new chemical policy, which is called REACH, and we have some issues uh, within this uh, policy concerning uh, uh, exporting of nickel and cobalt salts, and we have some questions in uh, ongoing anti-damping investigation, for example, seamless tubes and pipes. And European Union's concerns, uh, which are well known to us, recycling fee for automobiles, ban on import on, uh, of live animals, technical, technical regulations on alcoholic beverages, and so on and so forth. But nevertheless, what family does not have its quarrels? I may quote the film uh, by James Goldman, The Lion in Winter. There exists uh, no trade irritants or quarrels that cannot be solved in a mutually beneficial way. WTO rules provide an effective basis for further developing Russia's trade relations with the European Union in a non-confrontational way. Russia's accession to the WTO should enable both partners to reap all benefits of this momentum. Um, and finally, uh, I would like to stress that uh, despite of all figures, percentages, and so on and so forth, uh, I think that uh, we believe in logic of the WTO. We believe in the rules of the WTO. And we believe that uh, following these uh, rules and norms, uh, we could arrive to a real good and uh, close cooperation with the European Union. Practically, we have no other choice. If we have other choice, then we will be doomed, strategically doomed. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I particularly appreciated the um, the slides detailing the uh, the marathon nature of your negotiation, which puts the Eurozone crisis uh, and some of the all-night summits and, and meetings that we've been subjected to here in Brussels in, in a bit of perspective. Um, but Mr. Kamakov, could you, uh, I was also uh, struck by another slide which showed the steady decline in public support for WTO accession over the last decade. Um, does Russia, do Russians embrace uh, the, the true goals of, of the WTO, of freer trade, or is it more of a membership of, of convenience? Because I think that you have heard clearly the frustration from Commissioner de Gucht. How do you overcome that if, if, it's, if this is a, a, a true partnership? How, do you, how does Russia now demonstrate that it's actually committed? I mean, one of the other uh, criticisms that I've heard in, in recent days is the fact that uh, that Moscow still hasn't appointed an ambassador uh, yet to the WTO. So how, how do you show that you're that you're truly serious about this? Thank you. Oh, thank you for your question. Uh, as to ambassador to the WTO, I don't know, <laughs> but. Uh, 
As to the uh, core element of your question, I believe that uh, uh, such a disparity in the position of uh, different people uh, in Russia uh, arrives from the fact that uh, a lot of people do not know what actually the WTO is. Okay, uh, business people know that uh, there are rules, there are norms, and so on and so forth, and uh, we uh, actually worked out our uh, legislation, which is practically, uh, which contains practically the norms of WTO, for example, uh, federal law for government procurement, uh, despite the fact that we are not member of the WTO uh, uh, agreement in this field. But practically, uh, our federal law, uh, 94 if I'm not mistaken, is uh, based on the rules of the WTO agreement. So uh, maybe, uh, 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 we have to we have to make more propaganda in good meaning of this word yeah about the WTO what is actually the, the WTO I was very often asked by business people in my country hey, hey Victor tell me please what does it mean the WTO rules and how we shall uh, adopt to this uh, the, uh, to these norms and so on and uh, uh, what should we expect from the WTO? My answer was very simple. Uh, enterprises who uh, uh, which are not effective economically effective will get bankrupt. Uh, enterprises who produce the production, the, the goods which are compared in quality and price, yeah, they will have a certain, uh, a certain uh, uh, period of adoption to adopt the rule. Uh, and uh, enterprises who produce very competitive production, they will uh, prosper and they will survive. Commissioner de Gucht, um, well, I wonder what you, what you make of that uh, response, but also it, it sounded from your comments like uh, you're, you're uh, quite close to, to possibly taking action. Um, is that a fair interpretation? And I, I suppose another question is um, how practical is that, um, especially given the nature, the, the fact that uh, most of, of Russia's exports are commodities? As I mentioned in, in my intervention, we will have a, a summit meeting the 21st of December. So that's within a couple of weeks. And that will, of course, give us uh, the possibility to discuss uh, this directly uh, eyeball to eyeball with uh, President Putin. No? Um, but I must say that at this moment in time, I'm rather upset about all this because uh, I have been negotiating this uh, deal with uh, Vice Prime Minister Shuvalov, uh, and I think it was a, a, a decent undertaking by both partners, and I can only see that since uh, Russia has become a member of the WTO, uh, they are doing exactly the opposite of, of what they are uh, supposed to do or what they have been promised to do, have, have been promising to do. And that's a little bit strange, huh? Um, for example, the the, uh, the, the uh, was the arrangement on on, on wood, uh, coniferous wood, and a very good uh, agreement uh, for the northern countries. But uh, in practice, uh, uh, Russia is not making the steps that uh, should make it uh, it work. There was an uh, undertaking by Russia on, uh, as uh, uh, the ambassador just said, on. Uh, uh, parts and components for cars, which was in fact an, uh, a quantitative undertaking. Um, and now we are all of a sudden confronted with the recycling fee, which makes our uh, 
exports to Russia more expensive instead of less expensive, no? Um, so that's a little bit strange too. What has not been mentioned by the ambassador is that uh, a lot of uh, uh, tariffs that were bound in the agreement have uh, now uh, been, uh, been raised to levels above the bound uh, uh, tariffs, which is clearly against the rules of the WTO. And I could continue for some time. So that it's, it's, it's very disturbing. Uh, a good one is also uh, the uh, Siberian overflight, where there was an agreement to make uh, away with this, a uh, very clear-cut agreement to do that. You know? um, no steps are taken. In, instead, uh, Russia has now been linking this uh, also to uh, uh, the ETS, uh, which was, but there was no talk about that in the agreement at all. So it's, it's very disturbing, and I, I will be very interested to, to, uh, to learn from Mr. Putin himself what uh, exactly he has on his mind, because uh, uh, it, it's, it's always strange that you negotiate something in good faith and that uh, once it is negotiated, uh, they are doing exactly the opposite of what they have been promising, you know? So uh, I, I cannot say very much more on this. Either we see movement in this file in the coming weeks, or we will be forced to go to the WTO for dispute settlement. We, we are left no other choice, you know? So I hope that uh, Mr. Putin, uh, the 21st of December, comes with a, uh, a message of uh, hope uh, to Brussels and has on his mind that uh, if you uh, don't uh, modernize your economy, uh, you are doomed strategically. So I, I, I hope it, he has it also on his mind when he comes to Brussels. I, I know the EU really, really championed um, Russia's accession. Uh, was the EU naive, perhaps, uh, either in negotiations or, or in what it expected? No, we, uh, we have certainly not been naive. Uh, and I can assure you that it, it, the discussions have been very difficult no? uh, and uh, painstaking because the, the 19 years doesn't tell much about the negotiation for, for the, the bigger part of the 19 years. There has been no negotiations, but uh, uh, Pascal will agree with me that the last months before their uh, entry, there have been very uh, um, uh, intense negotiations uh, bilaterally and multilaterally. It has been an enormous effort. So we have not been naive. But uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a normal expectation that when you conclude an agreement that both parties uh, uh, at least try to uh, put it into practice uh, on the basis of, uh, of good faith, you know. And then we cannot, I, at this moment in time, honestly speaking, I cannot come to that conclusion. Maybe I get an explanation for that in the coming weeks, but at this moment in time, I simply don't understand that you make an agreement and then you do well, a lot of things that go simply against it, you know. But it's, to me, that's very strange. We are making quite a lot of agreements, and uh, you have always some difficulties in applying an agreement. That, that you can happen. Uh, but uh, to do the opposite, that's strange. Uh, it was not completely unexpected, though, because... Uh, President Putin said that once they were in the WTO, before they joined the WTO, by the way, that they were going to protect their businesses in another way. They, 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 he has openly stated that. And then you could say, was it not naive to have an agreement? No, I don't believe it was a naive because there is an agreement and it, may, it might and may take some time to enforce it, but uh, um, the WTO, it's, an, it's a, a, a rules-based organization, no? And it's on the basis of, of those rules that we will, uh, uh, we, we will go to the dispute settlement mechanism if, if necessary. It can take some time, but uh, I think now at least uh, the, uh, the frame is clear. The frame is the WTO, unless all of a sudden Russia will decide to get out of the WTO. It's a frame, and, and okay, we will, we, will be, we will take our time and our effort uh, to make uh, the rules of the WTO prevail. Uh, Mr. Lamy, is that a, a fair assessment? Is it uh, perhaps a bit, uh, a bit premature? Uh, how, how do you see the situation? Now, if there's one thing I 
cannot say at this stage is uh, who's right and who's wrong, uh, for a simple reason that uh, we have no case. We'll help you. <laughs> up to you, up to you, <laughs> up to you, and that's the right of each every member of the WTO to bring a case uh, against another member into the litigation process. Uh, the good news is that if you do that, you will get a determination, and you will get a determination very quickly. I would not enter into the game of uh, comparing how long it takes to get a decision from the European Court of Justice as compared to how long it takes to get a decision from the appellate body of the WTO, uh, but based on comparative advantage, we're doing quite well. And that's, at the end of the day, what really matters, is that the players on both sides can be confident that it is a rules-based system and that if rules are breached, this will be adjudicated. Now, let me just add one thing which sometimes uh, people, notably in business, uh, don't always understand about the way WTO works. WTO is a rules-based system for the rules which the members of WTO have decided to construct together. So the perimeter of the rules of WTO is not each and every part of business life. There are elements in business life, in trade relations, which impact trade, which impact the way you trade, which impact your competitive advantages, <coughs> which remain outside of the net of rules of WTO. And for a simple reason, which is that, again, 157 sovereign nation states decide to enter into contractual disciplines or not. And in some areas, they have not decided to enter into disciplines, like, for instance, investment, which remains a bilateral issue, uh, like uh, uh, competition. There is nothing in WTO disciplines that implies that a country has to have a certain standard of competition policy. Uh, like corruption, for instance, which we all know in many countries, and uh, including uh, within Europe, uh, sometimes <coughs> impact uh, business or trade deals. So, we will enforce, because that's what the WTO machinery knows how to do, the rules which our members have subscribed. Whether these rules need to be improved in order to catch <coughs> elements which business people would wish to catch is another story, and this has to go through a proper new mandated negotiation. Yeah, if, if I may um, just add on that, Scott, because you are obviously um, um, a man with great experience, I mean, wouldn't the general assessment of having concluded negotiations after many years be that from then on, things go smoothly, things get better, um, it's easier to deal with each other, and um, especially when it's with your most important trading partner, as um, Mr. Karnikov pointed out in his presentation, that. EU is an extremely important trading partner for, for Russia. But then um, we can see on, 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 um, in many regards that very few, well, a few months, a few weeks after these conclusions have been reached, um, on the horizon appears the possibility of uh, having a case at the WTO. I mean, is that not something that you find at least interesting? <laughs> Again, I'm, uh, my job is not to find things interesting or uninteresting, <laughs> to just get these things done. Uh, but true, I mean, I've had some uh, experience in this field, uh, including in a previous uh, life uh, in Brussels. Uh, and look, as a sort of normal, uh, prudent 
manager of my organization, uh, I have a bit of margin of maneuver to increase uh, the resources of my legal service. Can I make a brief remark? Yes. Uh, a brief remark about the uh, WTO logic and um, uh, about uh, our recycling fee. The problem is not the uh, implementation of recycling fee. The problem is you, c you can implement the internal taxes, internal fees, and so on and so forth. WTO says that uh, you have to make it equally. You have to make it non uh, discrimin discri in a non-discriminatory way. That's uh, the question. Of course, we can agree that a recycling fee is not a happy subject for European Union, but the problem is whether this uh, issue protects internal producer or not. Whether this issue, whether this fee uh, protects or it creates better conditions, uh, privileged conditions for internal producer. That's the question. If you apply internal taxes, fees, and so on and so forth equally in a non-discriminatory way, please, uh, uh, so you, you have not the subject to go to the uh, uh, um, uh, to the, uh, the dispute settlement body. Yeah, thank you. I have a question here from the audience from uh, uh, Mr. Godmanis, the, the former yeah, Latvian I'm Prime from, Minister. I'm from Aude also. There's one thing that we heard. Mr. Guch said that there's a lot of problems uh, approaching just recently after the implementation of a signing agreement. Mr. Kalmikov show 18% growth of export, EU towards Russia, and only 78 vice versa. From 300, a little more billion, uh, 200 is uh, export on, on the Russian side, 100 EU, that's right. But the growth is 18%. What, what is the sense? It's a little bit contradictory. Because if it will be some problems, erased, erasing problems, then this growth will not go three times more one way as another way. Could you explain it, please? This is Kalmikos, Mr. Kalmikov's data. He showed 18% growth to June exports EU to Russia, and 7.8 vice versa. So it's a little bit not, it's strange what kind of products then have such serious growth in the one year. We, we quoted only uh, Eurostat. No, no, but you know no. what products they are anyway. If there's a problem... Uh, the, uh, the, the product range of the Russian exports is very limited, uh, which means that in fact it could only rise considerably if, they, if we would... Uh, uh, buy uh, still more oil and gas from them. And that's a little bit where it, where it comes uh, down to. Or steel and vice versa. We are very good exporters, you know. No, well, we are very good exporters. Uh, but it's not because we are very good exporters that we uh, uh, have to accept that uh, uh, a number of uh, practices uh, uh, persist, but are also introduced that are contrary to WTO rules, because that's uh, the rules they have uh, agreed to. I'm very pleased by the fact that uh, our exports rose by 18.2%. And you know that in 2011, 0.6% of the European growth um, is uh, due to exports. And it will be about the same in 2012. Um, so I don't have to apologize because uh, we have uh, good results in exports. Huh? Thank you. My name is Kelam. I represent Foreign Affairs Committee of this Parliament. Uh, it has been very interesting and useful to have all the actors together, and I think we are mutually interested to have progress. Mr. Commissioner concluded that progress that far has been limited. Uh, the EU argument in supporting Russia's WTO membership was that in this way, uh, it would commit Russia's authorities to obey the rules of international trade. I think now we have to decide more about philosophy of this approach. Uh, I think there's still a strong Leninist tradition also existent. Lenin uh, 
one time said that treaties are like pie crusts, they are made to be broken. So uh, we should not be, see it as a strange that, that we agree upon something and then we will deviate from it. Maybe it's like, more like uh, cherry picking, but uh, we should remind uh, the story about Energy Charter Treaty, which Russia signed, then abstained from ratification, and we heard the argument by then Russia's uh, chairman of Foreign Affairs Committee here in the parliament that, you see, times and conditions have changed. When Russia signed it, it was okay. Now Russia has become more strong and it doesn't, uh, doesn't suit uh, our, our expectations. But I think uh, what, what we need to understand, it's not a family quarrel. I, I can't agree with this argument. Uh, because WTO is for all, and that is about credibility, basic credibility, which is the basis of all, all fair trade. So we still have to face the situation. Russia has possibility to live up to its commitments. The European Parliament has adopted a resolution last month about this, and uh, we very much look forward that our Russian friends and partners would, would live up to it. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if any of our, our panelists want to respond to that, or, or also if there are any, a few other quick questions, because I know that uh, Commissioner de Gouk has to leave very shortly. Um, but please, just a questions, not, not, not statement, in the interest of time. Yeah, I have only one question. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, I have studied physics and informatics, and um, I want to ask uh, the representative of the Russia, um, the, it was a question of um, gas market uh, between all the gas producer countries from Asia and Europe, and uh, uh, the Russian position is no. Uh, I want to know what is the advantage and the disadvantage of this open gas market from the Russian position. I'm sorry, you would like that Russia should open its gas market, or? No, I say that um, um, the country there export gas, yeah. like Kazakhstan, yeah. a lot of gas in the uh, uh, Black Sea now. Yeah. Um, they want to, 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 to do an open gas market where the gas price is fixed. And uh, Russia don't want uh, uh, they I, I think that that is the position of Russia. So I want to know if you know about it, and if yes, what are the advantages and disadvantages from the Russian point of view for a gas open gas market for uh, all the countries that are gas you. exporter? The was a fixed price; it's not belong a price to the petrol. It's only a fixed price for the gas because. European countries are import a lot of gas from Russia. And they do have a uh, lot yeah, of problem with this. Huh? Yeah, yeah. That, that is my uh, question. Yes, first of all, I never heard about the Kazakhstan position that they would uh, make any uh, openness in the gas market because uh, actually there exists no gas market as it should be. If you are free to buy a goods in a uh, on the international market, it is an open market. You can come and buy. Yeah. I'm going to actually uh, suggest maybe you can, can answer this on, on the sidelines yeah, afterwards yeah, uh, yeah. because I'm afraid the Commissioner does have to leave. Um, and I just I yeah. wanted to take yeah. a moment before he does so yeah. to thank him actually, and all in, the other panelists. In 10 minutes, I have to leave as well. Ah, sorry. <laughs> Forgive me. Um, anyway, thank you again all very much and a special thanks to the panelists. Uh, Cheers. You have different people sitting here now. Mr. Shuklin is uh, there and will join us up here. And it's a new moderator who will introduce all the panelists. I just kind of um, <laughs> uh, introduce him. <laughs> and it's... Uh, um, who, Brian, Brian Johnson from Parliament Magazine, who made 
his best efforts to recover quicker than he usually does from a cold to be able to be here and um, uh, assist us in that seminar. And for, so far, he's surviving. Yes. So um, we hope this continues at least until 5.30 and that we can count on his moderating um, services. There you go, Brian. You. Uh, thanks, Ivana. I will <laughs> try and survive. Excuse me if I cough and splutter or sound a bit strange. Um, well, how do we follow that? Because uh, I certainly found that fascinating. Uh, but this session, uh, official title is Russia's WTO membership benefits and challenges. But perhaps it's also we should remember what the, the main title of this uh, event is. Um, will the WTO change business? And so I think we're looking here about what the benefits and challenges are to businesses, both European and Russian. Um, what this all means, this is a question that journalists ask all the time. We hear policymakers talk about everything. And we go, what does it mean? What's going to change? So we have some, luckily, some experts here, because I'm a generalist. I've got Richard Connolly, who's a lecturer at the Centre for Russian and East European Studies, and just happens to be an author of a study, which is quite handy, on the economic significance of Russian accession to the WTO. So thank God for that. Uh, we've got Sergei uh, Shuklin, who's president of the Russian European Chamber of Commerce here in Brussels, and Pascal Kernis, who's the managing director of the European Services Forum Brussels. So a nice mix, I hope, there. And uh, we also have um, Christ uh, Kristalina uh, Ujiland, who's going to uh, finish the event with some comments. And of course, I'm sure Silvana will jump in whenever she wants. Um, I think with this, we'll try and get some quick presentations and then get it out to the audience. I think questions, 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 yeah? But uh, Richard, if you want to start. Is this, oh, sorry, <laughs> not used to this. Usually I speak in front of a very small academic audience of about five or six people, two of whom usually sleep. <laughs> um, but, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so if you stay awake, I'll be very grateful and um, not, not at all used to it. Um, I did, as Brian noted, write a report on um, the likely effects of the, uh, Russia's accession to the WTO. Of course, nobody knows um, what, what it was going to be. Uh, and this was, I think, published about, God, about five or six months ago. Um, and I'm going to just quickly outline some of the main points that I made in this study. Um, and I'm going to try and do it in the most non-academic fashion possible. Um, so I'll try and refrain from any technical terms. Now, what's become apparent from the previous uh, panel is much of the things that I wrote about six months ago seem to be uh, transpiring. So I at least have some ability to look sort of six months into the future. Now, basic points. What did I make in this report? Well, the main one is that the According to econometric estimates, I'm not going to talk about how they were uh, derived or calculated, but about 75% of the benefits that Russia is supposed to um, get from joining the, uh, the WTO are supposed to come from increased foreign direct investment in business services. So this isn't from access to external markets. This isn't from um, increased um, gains to consumers. This is, in the main, from increased FDI um, in business services, things like banking, insurance, transport, logistics, legal services, things like this. So I guess the main point to think then is, well, what's the FDI environment like in Russia? And I'll make a few very basic points. The first one is that the environment for FDI is probably better than a lot of people, I think, um, seem to think, at least according to much of the Western press. If we look at the growth in, uh, in, in FDI over the last decade or so from Europe and from other destinations in Russia, it's been comparatively high. Um, if we also look at levels of inward for foreign direct investment in Russia compared to other so-called BRICS, so sort of, you know, China, Brazil, India, and other large populous emerging economies, Russia again compares quite favorably. So um, I think that's a point worth making, that Russia has been more open to FDI, I think, than some people realize. However, there are significant administrative barriers to FDI, regulatory barriers, informal barriers, all sorts of barriers. Um, which these businesses have to uh, overcome. And part of Russia's commitments to joining the WTO were to reduce many of these um, barriers. And I guess the main point that I made in my ref uh, report uh, six months ago was, it's all very well if Russia signs up to these, uh, makes these very sort of well-intentioned commitments, but implementation is key, as we've just heard. So and there are three main points that I made when I said implementation is key. 
The first one is if we look at evidence from other countries that have joined the WTO, we don't tend to see any particular uh, sudden increase in the quality of, of law, of legal um, implementation of laws, um, of, um, of the rule of law more generally. In any country, if we look at all the countries that joined the WTO in the last 20 years, Basically, there's no relationship whatsoever. For some countries, it gets better. For some countries, it gets worse. So the idea that the WTO would have you know, acted as an external anchor that would have driven um, uh, reform in Russia, I think, is a slightly naive one, if we look at the um, experience of other countries. And this, for me, shows that domestic determinants of reform are most important. Not joining an international organization. It's what happens um, on the ground. So that's the first point. The second point is and this is related to the first point, is state capacity is key if you're going to implement um, international agreements. You have to have a fully functioning administrative um, a bureaucracy that can basically go out and implement laws, make sure that they're being obeyed by the, by the population. And unfortunately, Russia doesn't score particularly highly on this, right? If the, the state in Russia is, is hopefully stronger than it was 20 years ago, 10 years ago, but it's still got a long way to go. Um, and this relative state incapacity, I think, is, could cause, you know, uh, sort of um, uh, more, I guess, difficulties in, in implementing a lot of the agreements that it signed up to as part of WTO accession in the future. There's one example, if we look at Russia's position on the, uh, um, I think somebody mentioned on the first panel, uh, the World Bank's ease of doing business. Um, if anybody finds these rankings particularly useful, I don't, but anyway, some people do. And Russia scores, for example, particularly you know, right towards the bottom on uh, customs, on the quality of, uh, of its customs service. And this is, of course, very important when it comes to trade. And the final, I think, key point about implementation is political will. And that's something, again, that was just, I guess, uh, touched upon in the previous panel. We've seen um, uh, the recent... The imposition of the vehicle utilization duties on imported cars, on pig imports, and there's a range of other things that, um, again, were discussed just then. And political will, I guess, is is most is it's it's half the case, half the battle. If the political will's there, then of course we've, we've got the problem of state capacity. But let's suppose we have to start with political will. Where's that going to come from? Well, I guess the thing, and I, I did want, I always try and avoid energy and oil and gas when I'm talking about um, the Russian economy. I tend to specialize on other areas of the economy. But unfortunately, the Russian economy and the, and the Russian state finances fiscal position is driven to a large extent, not so much by gas prices, but by oil prices. And oil prices have historically tended to pr um, provide a good, um, act as a good predictor of whether or not the government is inclined to um, carry out much in the way of domestic economic or wider reform. And at the moment, the price of oil is pretty high, right? Um, it's uh, around about $110 a barrel at the moment. This is by historic standards in real terms towards the top end. And this means that there's not a massive amount of incentive for the Russian government, as it stands at the moment, to engage in meaningful, sustained um, efforts at domestic um, economic reform. So I think that this is going to be the key indicator for the future. Whether or not this is going to, uh, whether the price of oil goes up or down, will determine whether or not the political will exists at the top um, to push through and to try and implement these reforms that it's signed up for as part of joining the WTO. Of course, once it, if it, that political will does um, transpire, exist in the future, we still then come up against the problems of state uh, capacity um, or the lack of it. And I'll just finish off with one final point that um, and related to, to oil, which I, as I said, I did want to try and avoid talking about, but nevertheless, I've done it. And that's how all of this shapes Russia-EU relations. And it seems to me the big issue um, for EU-Russia relations, of course, there's talk about um, signing a, a new trade agreement between uh, the EU and Russia, which at the moment is, is being slightly undermined by Russia's um, membership and, uh, and, and position on the ECU, the Eurasian Customs Union. But that's also the uh, but the other, I guess, even more important issue for me at the moment is the position on... Uh, the, 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 the DC competition Gazprom case. Um, what happens here for me will also be a good indicator of whether or not the Russian government is going to signify an intent to carry out increased reform in the future. If this issue can be resolved with compromises presumably on both parts, but particularly on the Russian side, it would to me suggest that there will be efforts to liberalize Gazprom 
if efforts are made to liberalise Gazprom, this for me would be a sort of a canary in the mine and suggest that greater efforts to liberalisation across the wider part of the Russian economy um, will take place. And if this does happen, then hopefully we'll start to see um, better behaviour in the WTO um, in the future. Although at the moment it is, of course, only early days and um, trade spats are nothing new um, between uh, countries. I'll finish there. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Richard. Um, it's interesting you talking about the, the F, uh, FDI there, the direct investment, and the 75%. I mean, the, the journalist friend, uh, Google, thank goodness for that, um, I had a quick uh, bit of research before I came here and found an article by Peter Mandelson, former Trade Commissioner, uh, just a few days ago. His words, quote, foreign capital is nervy to put it mildly, to invest in, um, in Russia. Um, you also talked about signals, and you mentioned it there. Um, it seems to me slightly strange that we're still talking about signals when we're, we've negotiated a WTO deal, as the, uh, Commissioner de Gook said, you know, here it is, here's what it means. Why are we still talking about what signals mean? It feels like there's still a long, long way to go in saying, right, here's where we are. If I'm a business, I want to invest. I can go for it, but I'm still waiting for signals to see if this is the right thing to do. Seems a bit strange. Maybe we can come back to that and see what the audience think. Uh, perhaps um, we can go straight over to our next speaker, though. Um, Sergi, if you just want to go in, and let's maybe try and be as quick as we can so we can get lots of questions in. Yes. Yeah, the, first of all, uh, thank you for being here and uh, to share some views on uh, the Russia's uh, accession to the World Trade Organization. So, uh, as uh, uh, the Russian representative said uh, previously, uh, it took just a long time to get uh, to this organization, to this business club, just, but finally it's there. And I do believe that Russia already can, can write a book how to get to a uh, World Trade Organization and just to, to avoid or uh, how to overcome just political obstacles, you know, to get there. But anyway, um, Russia is there, so what we got? And how we can analyze just, you know, uh, how the uh, already members of a World Trade Organization, uh, what they got uh, from this accession and uh, what Russia has. And I do believe it's about just eight years ago, I, I saw the big research, you know, uh, from, uh, made from one of the uh, research companies in Russia, and uh, which was done through the old regions in Russia and the main businesses. And I would say just 90% of people at that time, or uh, business managers, regional uh, managers, or governors, they said, no, we don't like this idea about accession. And uh, it's good just, you know, Russian government just anyway took the road and just followed to, to get in here. So Russia actually uh, took the obligation right now to work uh, on the one, one rule, World Trade Organization. And as the, the uh, director, general director of World Trade Organization said, uh, now we are juries, right? So uh, what, what, is, uh, what is that for Russia? Uh, we, we have to remember, so some years ago, it's from numbers, you know, I do remember, the custom duties were the, the main, uh, uh, I would say, chunk of the Russian budget. So it was a serious step from Russian government to, to go and uh, to lower the uh, tariffs. And of course, you know, they somehow the Russian government is looking for the uh, replacement of this uh, money. And of course, uh, another thing, just another point, uh, you, you know just uh, Russia is the member of the uh, BRICS uh, uh, countries and Russia uh, is the member of the Customs Union, uh, which was created recently with Kazakhstan and uh, Belarus. So, Pretty much, Russia is balancing on the on their obligations with other organizations and with World Trade Organization. But they still uh, they still wanted to do that because uh, there's only one way, uh, as the Russian president actually said, one way, uh, way to be integrated to the uh, to the world economy uh, in playing under one rules. And uh, of course, uh, 
you know, like few months, we already have claims, right, from European Union. Uh, as the uh, Trade Commissioner already said, just the clock is ticking. Uh, but is it, is it really time just you now to start, just you now to throw just claims, you know, and counterclaims? Probably not, because we have to learn just, you know, from both sides, you know, how it works and with Russia. And I do believe Russia will follow this, you know, from the news I read, just will follow the old claims and just you know, try, uh, try to fix it. Uh, when we were talking about the, uh, when the Trade Commission was talking about uh, duties or tariffs for utilization of cars, and which uh, may affect uh, the car producers from Europe, you know, um, I kind of, uh, kind of surprise of uh, such claim for simple reason. Russia doesn't have really car industry, right? And uh, whatever just no tariffs will uh, Russian government apply on the car uh, producers. It actually will apply to the buyers, you know, the Russian people, right? And anyway, they will still buy those cars. You know, there's no, no competition anyway. And, no, I'm just not looking at you, but you know, <laughs> you didn't have to answer. Yeah, yes, of course. Uh, uh, Russian side, they have to learn just how to work under uh, World Trade Organization rules, and there are a lot of questions because uh, my organization uh, probably we uh, we feel just we are getting through us, you know, both sides, European businesses and Russian businesses. We know what they need, what they. Uh, what they're looking for, and there's so so many trade barriers. You know, they're still there. Just uh, we are talking about certification uh, issues, but Russia is working on this way. So uh, I think just you know there should be uh, a little time given uh, Russian government to to find a way how to work with European Union and, and as a uh, it's it's nice you know to say trade club uh, members. Because that's the only way, just you know, we we can develop that right. That's yeah. I, I can say more, that, but you know, it's my my, pre, my previous you know uh, colleagues. They already said pretty much uh, the most uh, what I wanted to share. So thank you for your attention. Right. Thank you, Sergey. I'm. S uh, I can feel um, Silvana desperate to jump in here. Do you want a quick comment, Silvana? <laughs> well, thank, you, thank you very much, just because I'm coming, I'm from a country where a lot of cars are produced and sold to the rest of the world from Germany. And um, just to, to uh, explain that recycling fee uh, and the context of it, before, um, um, before August last this year, the import duties on automotives were lowered because of a WTO um, uh, accession. Now, after WTO accession, there was a recycling fee imposed for cars which are imported into Russia, payable at the time of import, not at the time when the car is about to be recycled. And this re recycling fee is higher than the uh, import duties were before on the automotives. Now, this applies, as you correctly say, um, as there is not that big of a Russian car production uh, and even less uh, car exports from Russia to the rest of the world at this moment. Who knows what, what happens? But it, apply, it doesn't apply to, ca to cars produced in Russia. And a lot of the European car makers, some significant German ones, open production plants in Russia. So a Volkswagen, which is produced in Russia, does not have to um, pay this recycling fee, uh, um, an Audi imported from Germany to Russia does have to pay this recycling fee. So it's an incentive to move the production to Russia. And by this, and that's why the EU does not like it, because it doesn't um, treat the producers on an equal basis, just to clarify that. Yeah, I just uh, I want to add because I am from the country which is the largest producer uh, in Europe from Slovakia. Mm -hmm. You know, it's pretty much um, we are on the same boat, right? And I understand uh, what you said, but you know, when we're talking about the uh, Volkswagen mm -hmm. and Volkswagen, we, you know, we, the largest yes. plant of Volkswagen is in Bratislava, uh, and we are talking the same the same uh, company producing cars in Europe, so the, it's the same company. Mm -hmm. So, uh, of, of course, you know, uh, I think the claim 
is uh, me has the ground, mm -hmm. has the ground, but it, it should be not the first claim. Uh, I think just you know uh, both uh, governments and both parliaments, you know, they they have to work with each other more closely, just to to see how to find the best way or best solution in in the communication, mm -hmm. so the nothing mm -hmm. will be uh, lost uh, during this communication, and then. I hope just you know, our countries, you know, will mm. will sell cars over there <laughs> more effectively. Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick question: Anybody from the uh, car uh, European car industry here in the audience today at all? No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you think of the two points there and this issue about these um, recycling fees? Uh, could you say who you are? Yeah, my, my name is uh, Angela Manz. I'm in charge for uh, trade policy at the VDA, which is the association of the uh, manufacturers and suppliers in Germany. And, um, of course, uh, we are affected um, uh, by the recycling field, all our manufacturers, and um, as far as I'm informed, um, also, as Volkswagen was mentioned, um, even if they have production in Russia, I think we all have the same opinion um, that uh, we want to work with Russia, but we want to have a level playing field. Yeah, I think all manufacturers have the same uh, opinion and also uh, su the suppliers. And um, I would also like to underline um, that I think it was very interesting today um, that there are chances for a constructive uh, solution. There are talks um, between Russia and the U European Union, and I th we think this is a very good way, and we hope that we do not need a WTO case. And um, I would also um, would have liked to ask the Russian side if uh, there are also talks about the technical uh, things on their way. Uh, because there are also many technical problems, but I think to talk to each other is a very good uh, solution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, how many times have I heard in, in so many events, uh, including Plug Parliament Magazine events, um, where I've heard organisations, especially industry, European industries, talk about a level playing field? Uh, it's just almost like a mantra now. And it feels that industry are certainly concerned more than ever before about this idea of level playing field. So perhaps maybe, um, you know, Pascal, this is an issue that you may uh, pick up in, in your short presentation. Short presentation. Uh, on you go. I'm going to talk a bit about the services and um, the WTO accession of Russia in this dimension. First of all, saying that uh, to be repeated again and again, the European Union is uh, the biggest exporter of services. Uh, internally and externally, wor worldwide, it is 1.3 trillions of euros per year, and we export outside the EU 560 billions. So more than 25% of world trade is about uh, services done by European Union. Russia uh, is also an, a big exporter of services, and it exports 55 billion euros of services per year. Uh, 50 9% of Russian economy is about services, GDP. So uh, uh, it is not only about gas, it is not only about petrol, it is not only about commodities, but it is also a services economy. And um, we are very pleased to see that between EU and Russia, the trade is going on very well on trade in services with uh, an increase of 260% between 2004 and last year. So um, that is um, an export of 25 billion euros, and uh, we have an, a benefit of 11 billion euros in 2011, which is you know, helping a bit the deficit that the EU has in goods with 90 billion euros. Um, so services is, is really important to sustain the European economy, um, and we still have a big maneuver possible uh, to increase trade with Russia because so far services is only 17% of all trade, while the world average is 22%. So we, we are confident that we're going to be able to continue our relationship with, with, with uh, Russia. And in particular, we are certainly confident that the WTO accession is going to help in, in increasing these figures. Uh, I, I hear the 18% the of increase uh, 
uh, per year, I am confident it's going to be much more in trade in services. Uh, it is true also, we have to admit that uh, since the services economy in Russia was really at its beginning, uh, uh, you know, 20 years ago, uh, it is, it is uh, a field for us which is interesting uh, to discover. So WTO accession on services is actually very good. Um, we have, I mean, we, we saw the, the figures uh, of um, Mr. Kalmakov that it was 11 sectors. What he forgot to say is 11 sectors has been committed out of 12. He said um, 116 subsectors have been committed out of 162. This is actually very good compared to many WTO members which are in the House for a long time. So, in theory, it's very good. And I'm going to, to go um, uh, through the list where very good commitment have been taken in legal services, in, in engineering, in postal and courier services, in distribution services where we have ma many European companies doing business there, uh, construction services, uh, travel, maritime transport, all of those services are very good. Business services, this is where the money is, this is where the value added chain is, and our companies are now new possibilities to do business in Russia. So that is, that is something we are lo really uh, looking forward. There are only some partial, but nevertheless, openness of, of, this, uh, of the Russia services market in air transport. We heard about the overflight problem. We hope this is going to be solved, but they haven't taken any, any commitment on passengers, uh, right? That, that is missing. Uh, a very Im important part which is missing to do properly business is what we call the mode four, the possibility to move the people around. And we have discussion bilaterally to have the visa facilitation with Russia, which is not yet completely finished, and we hope this is going to be going through, but that has not been done in the WTO. Fin finally, uh, two big uh, important services sectors, financial services. Uh, where in banking, uh, we have got very interesting commitments. In insurance, much more difficult. Uh, and they have taken commitments over a transitional period of five, even nine years for some instances. Um, so there, there is still need things to be done. In telecom also, we finally have got, after tough negotiation, the possibility, like in all the sectors I just mentioned, the possibility to open a subsidiary 100% in Russia. And that is a luxury in the world, because that is not possible in many countries in the world. So uh, for Russia, this is something we welcome very much, but, because there is always a but, we need to have and to go through a subsidiary. It is not possible to open a branch in Russia or across the sectors. That is fine normally, but the problem when you know Russia is that you have to go through very burdensome, costly, lengthy process of getting your license, getting your authorization to proceed. And that is, of course, something that we would like to see a modernization of, of, of the services economy. So I would say it is too soon to judge um, uh, whether this good paper is going to be transformed into the reality. Also, we have also to admit that for services, um, most of the commitment that, take, that, that are taken by countries, uh, including Russia, is actually binding existing legislation. So there is not much new legislation which has to be adopted by the Numa, Duma to implement all of those openings that we have got in these commitments. So we're very confident that something is going to go through. Um, also in terms of investment, because services is not only about exporting across the border, and you have seen the figures, but it is essentially also about setting up an office in Russia uh, to invest there. And if you go through the list of the Association of a European Business in Russia, uh, there is a very large number of services companies doing business there, and I'm, I'm sure it's going to be even uh, going further and increase. And, and the investment of the European Union is 120 billion euros uh, uh, in 2010, uh, 10, I think. Um, but um, a very large part is into services. So uh, th there is something there to be said. But yes, we will monitor. We will see if um, this good, good aspect is going to be transformed into the reality for all the sectors. Because we have to admit, an investor need predictability. An investor need confidence. And that trust is tending to go away because the trend into the new legislation which have been adopted by the Russian government in the recent months is not good. 
Uh, you have heard, so far I haven't heard anything in the services sectors, but as, it, as, as the business uh, uh, representative here also, of a European business representative on this panel, you have got the list uh, of the recycling fee on vehicle. There is um, imports uh, on woods, there is some barriers, new, new tariff barriers, new technical barriers that are introduced on the standard issues by, by Russia, which is making life difficult. You know, um, a quota authorization process, which is very complicated to go through. You have to go on the certification by notary into translation, et cetera, et cetera. This is making life very complicated. Uh, export duties on paper, um, the beer, with new, new standards and increasing the malt level in the beer that our, our, our producers of beer don't know what to do anymore with this, with this country because you have to, to change your standard every, every week. Um, on textile, uh, the, ban, the ban on life animal, all of those things are not good. It is not showing the good direction that, yes, it is good time to go and invest in, in Russia. So legislation have been, I mean, commitment through the WTO accession has been taken by Russia, not only in the tariff line, not only in the scheduled services, but also on um, transparency and predictability, legislation and transparency and predictability. We're going to wait for that one because we have to be honest, bureaucracy is a major problem in Russia. Corruption is a major problem in Russia. And we have to do this. And I, and I don't agree with Richard that this uh, doing business report by World Bank is, is, is only a fact. No, this is reflecting the reality. And, and, and this, this rank, which is 123 out of 183, this is what, where Russia is, it is showing you a trend that this country is not really welcoming business. And that is something we hope that by going and investing there, we will be able to moder modernize the economy. I heard that Russia is, 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 is going to work towards uh, accession to the GPA, government uh, public procurement agreement. Of course, we are very much interested in, in this area also. There are a lot of services which are going to be, which, which, are, which are participating in call of tenders uh, to do business in Russia. That is important. OECD accession, another very important tool for what? Not only for studies, but when you accede WTO, you also accept some rules and disciplines, and, and, and that is something which is very, very important for uh, doing business in Russia. So we're going to look at this implementation, but we're confident in the future of doing business in Russia. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Pascal. Um, as, as they say in all the worst uh, books and novels, uh, the devil's in the detail. Uh, Pascal, you're talking about opportunities. Um, they're there, but you need predictability. You need confidence. You need the right signals. Yeah, again, um, Richard, I think what you mentioned, you said, actually, the direct investment um, environment is better than most people think. Yet, yet another figure for you to look at, the one here. Um, the World Bank's latest due business survey, uh, Russia's ranked as 112. So, you know, what is the perception? Good, bad, indifferent? Um, let's open to the floor. I mean, you've got various experts here from different aspects, and you've got two MEPs. Um, anybody got a qu oh, straight there at the front. One, one number was amazing. You said 55 billion export services in Russia, which is uh, little less than 10 percent for EU. 50? Yes, yes. Have you included the transportation, oil, gas, and uh, raw materials services also in that? Could you characterize the structure? Because it's amazing normally. If you take it into account, this service that I understand. But if you say 59% services, could you characterize what kind of exports of Russia's services are existing this time? Very short in, in, in main features, please. Yeah. 59% of the service of the Russian economy yes, is yes. into services GDP. I'm talking about export services. And the please. export is 55,000, uh, 55 billion euro. What euro. kind of structure is it? That, that is that is the traditional structure for all export of all countries. Services is is all the sectors I have mentioned, uh, and and the services of transport is what you pay to use the pipeline or to use the the the, the, the ship, right? It is not the price of what the ship is transporting. No, 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 I know it. The question is different. If you talk about such amazing number, for me it's amazing. Uh, if you say that the 55 billion in exports, it could be the companies Russian who are providing transportation of oil, gas, raw materials, 
then it's an export service. Or it could be the banking activities, or it could be some activities which are real exports, let me say, if, for example, they, they attract tourism. Attract tourists, also export, but could you characterize it as a big number? Yeah, I mean, th this is a number given by OECD and, and WTO, so I'm not going to contest them. This is some ah, figures I'm using. Me. No, no, no I'm it's not really inventing nice. them. I, I, I thought that you know the main features, if not so. No, no, the main fe the, no, I don't know. The main features for services are always travel, transport, and business services. Mm. All thank, the services. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think Richard's champion at the bit here as well to get in. Just a little bit because uh, I have a strange fascination with statistics and you asked for the composition of Russia's export yes. services and you're right, financial service is one of the key areas and it comes under business services of the sort that Pascal's talking about and if you look at Russia and its outward foreign direct investment as well as exports in financial services it's um, disproportionate to its level of income compared to, you know, let's say China or um, India or uh, other countries, middle -in lower middle income countries. Russia does particularly well on that. So that's one area where, um, according to the data, Russia is particularly you. strong. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the gentleman here, right in the middle. Um, hello, just a small question to, uh, to Richard uh, concerning the foreign direct investment, or investment in Russia. I have the particular question about the character of foreign direct investment. So where does it originate from? For example, it might be from Cyprus and then it's absolutely different character of investment things. <laughs> good question. <laughs> Right, just an, yeah, that's a, a good question. Not just Cyprus, the Virgin Islands and uh, <laughs> other big uh, known countries for, uh, for foreign direct investment. Of course, if you look at the level of, of, of Russia's um, stocks or flows of uh, IFDI, they are comparatively high. If you then yeah. strip out what you would, let's say, is round-tripping repatriated Russian capital, um, then it is... It is a lower level. It's, you, would def, you would deflate it somewhat. It's still, it's still not bad, right? It's still pretty good, given its level of income. So I think you know, that's true, um, that the sources, like things like Virgin Islands and Cyprus are largely um, Russian sources of investment. But what that does mean is that, um, on the positive side for Russia, is that um, fixed investment um, is actually, uh, of domestic sources, is probably higher than the official data would reveal. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pascal, do you want to? No. Uh, any more questions? That figures are oh, yeah, the figures. Well, I think, maybe yeah. I, can, I can complement to this question because Business Europe just produced a, a, a brochure today uh, mm -hmm. uh, in there. Um, on the FDI, first of all, 51 to manufacturing, 49 to different services, sectors, sales, marketing, logistic, research and development. Uh, testing and servicing, uh, education, yeah, training, etc., etc. And when you look at where the money is coming from, uh, Cyprus, Netherlands, Virgin Islands, Bermuda, Bahamas, Luxembourg, Germany, Sweden, France, Ireland. So this is the order. Yeah, but but um, all the latter Netherlands, British Virgin Island, Bermuda, Bahamas, Luxembourg added up doesn't come to the same amount that comes from Cyprus alone. If I may, right? Yeah, yeah, Cyprus. So, well, basically, that means that it's not originally a foreign investment. Uh, I'm sorry, basically it means that it's not originally a foreign direct investment. It's the reinvestment of capital that goes after from Russia, goes into the capital in Cyprus or offshore zones, and then comes back. Doesn't bring any benefit to Russia itself, as, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you can find the stats. Uh, yeah. It's just here. Uh, we just got it. www.businesseurope.eu. You can probably download it from their site. It's interesting reading. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, the reporter. Um, today it was um, International Transparency Index published, and Russia scored very, very low grade. It's actually lower than Uganda. It's on 130 third place. So my question is are to Russian representative at, at the panel, first of all, uh, what are the mechanisms to fight uh, corruption? Because it's a great concern also for small businesses. And how can you do that in an environment where non-governmental organizations um, have difficulty to operate because there are new law restricting them? I, you know, just uh, you have a good question. Just uh, yeah, even I don't know how to answer, because uh, I would say yes, 
corruption is there, and uh, if to compare corruption, just you know, I knew uh, recently, just you know, in the years, uh, now it probably it's on the peak. Uh, and of course, uh, when uh, when you're talking about new law, uh, Russia uh, implemented uh, about uh, NGOs. Uh, it's probably uh, it probably was a reaction on some of NGOs. I don't know. I, I think just you know this law uh, about uh, uh, those uh, organizations uh, will not live uh, for a long time. So it's just like some transition uh, period. That's my belief, <laughs> you know. I, I do not represent the Russian government. But once, once uh, Russia just committed uh, uh, itself to the World Trade Organization, actually, uh, it should help. It should help uh, to make things uh, going in Russia more transparent. And uh, that's what uh, I do believe in that. And of course, uh, We'll see just uh, and uh, what will happen in one year. Just you know, we'll see. Just after two months, you know, a few months, we we cannot really just you know compare just what was before and now. But it goes this way. Just you know, just more transparency uh, should be there. Yes. Thanks, Sergey. So you know, at some level, the WTO is uh, the the um, agreement will drive this. Will drive transparency. Richard, do you agree? You don't. I just wanted to address the, the question that was just asked there because there were a couple of points. The first one is this NGO law. On the plane, on the way over, funnily enough, I was reading this law on NGOs. And I think the main um, restrictions will be imposed on NGOs who, have, uh, who are funded foreignly, by foreigners who are concerned with human rights protection. That's a relatively small number of, uh, of NGOs, some very important and very uh, well-known ones like Memorial and the like, but it's to do with human rights. If you're, for example, concerned with business or the environment or other ones, the, the law does provide, it says that you're excluded from this new law. So that's my understanding of the way the law is written um, on, on NGOs. So it seems to me that it's not as big a problem as has been presented in some parts um, of the press, that's, that's how, my interpretation. And secondly, on Transparency International, Russia does score very low. But again, my understanding until very recently was that Transparency International's methodology, and I'm sorry I'm an academic, but is pretty poor. They interview people who haven't even been to Russia, who've never done business with Russia, and say, what's your perception of corruption in Russia? And these people say it's terrible, because it scored really lowly last year. Right? Russia surely has all sorts of problems with corruption, but depending on how you measure it, it determines how bad the problem is. And if people, for example, use other survey data that measures how much people pay in bribes, Russia's still pretty bad, but it's about what you'd expect for a country of, of its level of, of income, right? So I guess my two points on that are let's be a little bit more balanced about some of the things that we, that we read um, in the press. Oh, thank you, Richard. Uh, Savannah, I think you want to jump in here. We're running out of time, so I think super quick. Yeah, just very <laughs> briefly. When we were at uh, the beginning of uh, last month in Moscow, we met a representative of Transparency International who were then about to conclude those um, uh, studies that we are seeing now. And uh, I, I'm not a member of, uh, I mean, I, 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 I'm not a don't know details about their work, but what he was telling us about how they work in Russia is that they get a lot of information from company representatives from within the administration on an, sometimes an anonymous basis because it's quite high risk if you leak this information to an NGO uh, about uh, corruption which goes on in public administration. And also talking to the representat representatives of the European business, uh, the association in, in Moscow, it was, uh, it was not even kind of a uh, point of discussion that it's corruption basically of every, on, on every level. If it's on a local, on a, on a national, um, if you need to get things done, uh, if you want it done within your own lifetime, if you want it done within, uh, then there is in some way or another uh, some form of corruption happening. And uh, Medvedev addressed it himself. Well, and he said that Russia has to do something about systemic, its systemic corruption. This is a bit forgotten at the moment, so um, um, I guess to, 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 to say um, that, that uh, Transparency International is not doing serious work on that and that it's not as bad as the figures might show, I think is taking it a bit too easy there. 
Whether the WTO will change business uh, remains to be seen, but it appears to be a direction and, and a system, as uh, was mentioned before, a set of rules that things can come out of, so there are opportunities there. I'd like to thank our panel um, and thank you for the questions. Uh, Christine is going to finish us with a closing remark and then it's next over a drinking sandwich. So thank you, thank you very much. I'd also like um, uh, to thank uh, all participants here in, in this uh, hall and, and of course the panelists. Um, and first of, all, oh, first of all, I'd like to just start with a positive comment uh, on corruption, because despite of the relatively low level of Russia's position in uh, today's uh, uh, review, it's still a little higher than it used to be last year. So there is some sort of progress, at least according to the um, uh, uh, International Transparency Organization. But let me say that uh, the big interest uh, today, uh, what uh, also um, was very well uh, seen in this um, uh, little hall, shows that um, Russia is uh, very, very important for European Union. And uh, if I was now sitting here about two hours, I was just um, trying to record uh, over this year, the year 2000, two, two, uh, 2000, no, 2012, yes. Uh, how much has been uh, happening in the European Parliament uh, in connection um, uh, with Russia? A uh, lot of uh, discussions, a lot of uh, seminars, a lot of resolutions, almost every each month in Strasbourg, in our full plenary, Russia has been in our agenda, either with the parliamentary elections, the pres presidential elections, uh, either with the summits and the conclusions, uh, results of the summits, or, or uh, recently with the Magnitsky case or, or the resolution on the Russia's accession to the WTO. And next week uh, we are facing another resolution on Russia, uh, what will give the parliament, uh, Parliament's guidelines uh, uh, on the negotiations between EU and Russia on the new uh, comprehensive agreement between the two actors. So Russia, Russia is always in the air and, and um, uh, I, I think that uh, both uh, partners need each other. We, we cannot uh, imagine uh, living, um, uh, being neighbours um, uh, and not working closely together. My second uh, point and, uh, and uh, perhaps the conclusion from today's discussion is uh, more like a philosoph philosophical point about the mutual understanding between the two partners. It's about the um, uh, political culture of um, two partners. And um, we, many of us had uh, and still have uh, high expectations from uh, Russia's WTO membership towards respecting the rules and also commissioners, many panelists today expressed uh, the position that WTO is a rules-based organization. But if we just uh, give uh, me uh, the opportunity just to remind when Russia was um, acceded to, to the Council of Europe, another noble organization of human rights, rule of law and, and democracy in 97, exactly the similar, similar high expectations were in here that Russia will become a democracy, uh, the country which respects the human rights and, and the country of the rule of, of law. So a lot of uh, time has passed and still uh, we all now know where Russia is in the moment and I still uh, uh, personally hope very much that um, Russia is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is going uh, to uh, well, implement uh, the WTO rules uh, sooner uh, as uh, they have been expecting uh, the, uh, the rules of the, of the Council of Europe. Mm, uh, and also the summit, uh, what we are heading now in, uh, in two weeks, uh, uh, hopefully will uh, help to clarify uh, some uh, very uh, important uh, uh, problems what uh, the Commissioner referred and what I'm not going to repeat here. Um, 
Well, and uh, my third point, I think, uh, what uh, was also uh, discussed and mentioned here several times, that uh, Russia is a sort of big country with its own uh, um, political and historic background, and somebody referred to the Leninist approach. I, I still believe that uh, still Russia is taking over the Western uh, uh, political culture that pacta sunt servanda, that all the treaties should be implemented. And it 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 can really become uh, the reality when, as, as you said very rightly in my view, that uh, only internally, only when there is a clear political will in Russia, this will happen. Russia can be a modernized country, Russia can be a democracy whatsoever, but only in case when they do it themselves and nobody from outside can really make, uh, make them uh, doing uh, things uh, differently if there is no political will. So uh, let's, uh, let's hope and, and trust that uh, Russia mm, uh, will get this political will uh, to, to, to change and then first of all uh, to change for better for its own citizens first of all and for its own business interest. And I will conclude um, uh, quoting uh, uh, the ambassador who uh, in my view also gave a sort of um, a positive note and a positive perspective uh, on uh, Russia's WTO membership and then he said something like that. He said, we believe the rules and the logic WTO <clears throat> and we can arrive to understanding. Well, let's hope that they don't only believe but they only implement the rules of the WTO. Thank you very much <laughs> once again. Thank you.